Hi, my name is James Grams, Senior Engineer at Keystone. I am presenting our fourth Tech Talk on tiered walls. Tiers can rarely be designed standalone. This Tech Talk explains why and walks the viewer through a simple tiered wall design. Tiered walls and global stability. Basics of tiered wall design. The rule of thumb in determining whether tiered walls can be designed independently is the 2H rule. If the distance between tiers is at least two times the height of the lower tier, the walls can likely be designed independently. If the separation is less than 2H, they cannot. Finally, for the 2H rule to be valid, the upper tier should be less than or equal to the lower tier height. Why does the 2H rule work? Consider a two to one slope. The stability factor of safety for a dry cohesionless soil equals tangent of the internal friction angle of the soil divided by tangent of the slope angle. For a 34 degree sand, that yields a safety factor of 1.34 above the normally required 1.30 safety factor. This simple calculation does not include cohesion, which is present to some degree in most in situ soils and would increase the safety factor, offsetting lower friction angle soils. Another consideration is the influence line from the upper tier. A two to one influence line is shown here starting at the bottom of the upper tier. A two H separation ensures this conservative influence line passes below the lower tier, so the upper tier does not surcharge the lower tier. Global stability calculations, don't forget them. They should be a part of all tiered wall designs. But what is global stability? Global stability calculations attempt to estimate the critical failure surface of a slope and determine the stability factor of safety. To evaluate global stability, a failure surface is estimated, usually defined by a circle for simplicity, and the slope is divided into slices. Slices at the top of the slope tend to produce failure. Those at the bottom of the slope resist failure. Shearing resistance along the failure surface, here's our failure surface, also resists failure. Multiple circles with varying centers and radii are checked by computer software to determine the critical failure circle with the lowest safety factor. This section shows how complicated the analysis can become when analyzing a tiered keystone wall. The material above the sliding surface is separated into slices. Slices can contain multiple soil types with different weights and strength properties. The failure surface can pass through geogrid layers. The geogrid layers provide additional shear resistance. Slices are acted upon by shear forces and normal forces on the sides. A normal force and shearing force act on the base of each slice. For simplicity, side forces are usually set to zero. This sequence of global stability calculations shows how this factor of safety of a tiered geometry increases when building a soil reinforced keystone wall. Here we have no facing and no geogrid. The factor of safety is 0.44. Now we've added the facing and our factor of safety is 0 0.84. If you notice our critical failure surface is moving outward. Here we've added geogrid to the wall facing. It, the walls appear to be designed independently and the factor of safety is 1.08. Now we increase the length of the lower reinforcement lengths, and this pushes our critical failure self surface out even further, and our new factor of safety is 1.30, which is what we're aiming for. In this section, we've increased the lower reinforcement lengths further to achieve a factor of safety equal to 1.50. This is sometimes required on certain projects based on the critical nature of the walls or due to a lack of knowledge of the site soils. So where do we start? 
We'll try starting with a sliding approximation to determine the lower tier reinforcement length. A sliding approximation can be used to estimate the reinforcement length of a lower tier. To do this, check sliding considering the reduced weight above the sliding plane. So we don't have this mass, if it were a full height wall, above this tier. So we have a reduced weight. Next, we need to apply the upper tier dead load surcharge to the lower tier and determine the tensions in the Jurger layers. We have two methods to do this, a load approximation method and a trial wedge analysis method. The first method, load approximation, applies the dead load surcharge times Ka, or the active earth pressure coefficient, fully below where the influence line intersects the back of the wall. Here's our one-to-one -one influence line, and it's we're using the full pressure. Now remember, the earth pressure coefficient K is equal to the horizontal pressure divided by the vertical pressure on a soil element. And so we're using active earth pressure which assumes the soil is moving away from the wall. The second method, trial wedge, checks potential failure planes by incrementally increasing the angle from the back of the wall. It takes into account, into account all the loads to determine PA, or the earth pressure. The angle that yields the maximum earth pressure PA is the failure plane. PA can be used to back calculate a KA. This is done at every grid level. This won't be covered in this tech talk. These influence zones, zones have been established from trial wedge analysis. Here's the critical influence zone. It's closest to the lower tier. This is a partial influence zone. And here's a minimal influence zone. Now that we know the basics, let's start the design example. We are analyzing two four foot eight inch tall tiered walls with eight degree batter separated four feet apart, a nine foot total tiered wall height. There's a three to one back slope above the upper tier and the retained in foundation soils are clay and we're not using cohesion. So C equals zero. To start, we need to determine the internal and external earth pressure coefficients, Ka. We are using Coulomb, consistent with the NCMA third edition. And we'll do it for the lower tier, and then we'll do it for the upper tier. Next, we'll estimate the grid length of the lowest tier. We'll try 60% of the total tiered height, or L equals six feet, which is 0.6 times the total heated height, nine feet. It's 5.4, we round that up to six feet. And just to let you know, based on the back slope and the soil parameters, the final grid length will likely be longer than this. Now we will do a simple sliding check using L equals six feet in the lower tier. This yields a factor of safety of 1.14, which is less than 1.5, which is no good. So let's try L equals nine feet in the lower tier. Using L equals nine feet in the lower tier, the factor of safety equals 1.61, which is greater than 1.50, which is good. So that's okay. Before we run global stability calculations, we need to determine the tensions in the lower tier reinforcements. To do that, we need the dead load from the upper tier. This is a QL Pro printout of the upper wall design. The upper tier can be designed like a single wall. 
The applied bearing pressure is highlighted here, 653 PSF. This is our dead load. Calculating the internal grid tensions is an internal analysis. NCMA 3rd edition conservatively uses the full surcharge for offsets less than two times the height of the lower tier. So here, we our offset, we have three feet from the back of the block to the upper tier or to the dead load, and that's less than two time, two h. Two h would be about um, you know nine feet or so. So we're going to use the full pressure pressure distribution at the back of the wall, which is equal to the vertical pressure, 653 psf times ka internal. These are the calculated grid tensions taking into account earth pressure and dead load surcharge. In the upper layer, we have 369 PLF. In the middle layer, we have 309 PLF. In the lowest layer, we have 360 PLF. We check grid strength, connection strength, and pull-out strength against these values. These tensions also match key wall pro results. Lastly, we check global stability. At Keystone, we use a program called G-Slope. These values here, under Compact 3, this C and the phi angle come from the, the, they come from the shear values at the, that we tested Compact 3s with at a grid level. So now, using L equals 9 feet in our lower tier, which we came up with in our in our um, sliding calculation, our factor of safety is 1.281, which is less than 1.3. So that's no good. So just by doing the sliding calculation alone, we were close, but we needed to be a little bit longer based on this global stability calculation. So we'll increase the grid length in the lower tier to L equals 10 feet. And now the new factor of safety is 1.322, which is OK. So that this would be the final design, more than likely. And lastly, we need to check between the tiers, and our factor of safety is 1.513 for this critical failure surface going between the tiers, and there's no problem there. That concludes this tech talk. I'd like everybody to go ahead and check out the newly revised Keystone Design Manual. That was done, and we just completed that in 2020 here. Um, if you have questions, you can email me at jgrams at keystonewalls.com, and you can ask me any Keywell Pro questions you have. I do have some videos of me creating the, this, this in Keywell Pro. So that's that. Thank you.